Following up on a video we made six months ago on this channel, highlighting the shrinking supplies of base metals in Western world inventories, this fresh chart highlights how dwindled the inventory level situation still remains at the London Metal Exchange. Perhaps this year's commodity price sell-offs and given recent relative fiat US dollar strength over other fiat currencies over the last year, that's helped quiet this still ongoing constraint in terms of being in the headlines and the news. But one only has to look back over the past dozen years or so to better understand how supply shortages in metals and in energy have happened of late. Going from the Chinese-led 2000s commodity boom into the early 2010s QE1 and QE2 era, investment capital had not yet been swept away into various bubbles such as the now collapsing tech sector bubble. A lack of capital investments and paltry values for base metals and energy over the past dozen years has mostly led us to this near no supply level quandary that we are still in. Later in this video, I'll further make a freshened case for how the world is understandably sleeping on the fact that there's also a building shortage, not merely in readily available, reasonably priced bullion products that are tiny, but eventually to even larger, full-sized bullion bars. 100 ounce gold bars, 400 ounce gold bars, and 1,000 ounce silver bars. But more on that in a few minutes. First, we're gonna turn to Fiat Federal Reserve Policy, which is still driving most of the market's short and medium term narratives. Apparently, mega financial conglomerate BlackRock is now signaling that the Fiat Federal Reserve is going to begin speaking to an eventual pivot in their interest rate hikings toward the end of this year, 2022. That's probably for the best. Now that the United States appears headed to paying one trillion or so per year just to afford the interest payments on our world record sized debt pile seemingly ever expanding. A couple of well-known market commentators took to Bloomberg to comment on what's ahead regarding macroeconomic concerns. We'll juxtapose a few highlights of what both billionaire Sam Zell and outspoken economist Norel Rubini said this past week. We're headed toward a recession. I mean, if you think about the fact that uh, in the last four years we've added seven or eight trillion dollars to our debt, people got crazy and, and they've in effect over-infected the world with way too much liquidity and the Fed was asleep at the switch. The result is that we've got a, a price to pay. There is an issue, though, going forward with the central banks and whether a lot of your thesis, Nouriel, is predicated on their inability to go through with what they need to do to get inflation down. Is that your base case? Is that the most likely outcome? Yeah. Right now, all central banks are playing tough and talking tough and acting tough, hawkish, because they have a problem of credibility. But in my view, there are two problems. One problem is that if they try to get to 2% inflation, they cause a recession. And this recession is not going to be short and shallow. It's not going to be garden variety. It's not going to be plain vanilla. It's not going to be two quarters of negative growth and then inflation collapses and they can ease again. In the book, I explain all the reasons why it's going to be a severe recession because of the debt ratio, because we're going into fiscal and monetary tightening. And at the same time, you not only have an economic crash, you're going to have also a fiscal crash. We're not only in fiscal dominance in this game of chicken between Treasury and central bank, where in what the folks at the Bank of International Settlement call a debt trap. There is so much private and public debt that if central banks try to fight inflation, they cause a crash of financial markets and not just the stock market. That's the least important. Credit market, bond markets, and that crash and financial crash feeds on the economic crash and vice versa. And therefore, they're going to wimp out and they're going to blink. And the first one was the Bank of England. The Fed is going to do the same. The ECB is going to do the same. Right now, the Fed is on the way to go from three towards 5%. You already have a stock market down 25%, NASDAQ even more, public REITs 33%. You have the crash of MIMI, of SPAC bubble, of the crypto bubble, private equity, venture capital, growth, everything is down. Credit is down. Leverage loan market is shutting down. CLO market is shutting down. And the only thing that used to be safe, there were government bonds. Now the price is correlated positively with equities. Because when inflation is rising, you lose money on your equity side, you lose money on your bond side. Yields have gone from one to four. And the price action downward on bond has been worse than in equities. 30% losses. So any 60, 40, 70, 30, or risk parity portfolio lost money on both hands. There yeah. was nowhere to hide. Even cash gave you a negative real return because of inflation. 
There are other alternatives that can protect you against this tail risk, but they're not the traditional ones. You've always been brilliant on leveraging the system, on credit. And we've heard from one fund manager after another that there is resilience in this corporate credit sector, even with the debt that they have, even with the low coupons that they're currently paying that will reset higher. Do you disagree? Do you think that people are overly <coughs> sanguine about the upcoming credit cycle? They are. Right before the COVID crisis, the Fed was writing reports on financial stability, pointing out the leverage of the corporate sector. Of course, high yield and fallen angels. But then during COVID, these folks should have gone bust, but they were bailed out. We bought even high yield that you remember, commercial paper and everybody under the sun. So the zombies were bailed out. And the excesses of having leveraged loans, CLOs, Covlite got even worse and people got even more indebted. This time around, the party is over because the Fed for now, we'll have to raise rates. Those debt service ratios are going to become impossible. And you get the double whammy for those corporates. You get a PL because income is going to right. fall because of the recession. And you get a debt problem with debt service ratio rising. And therefore, there'll be a corporate debt crisis, one we avoided during the GFC and during the COVID crisis. Right. It's no, coming no. now. The CLO and leverage loan market are shutting down right now. It was one thing to borrow all that money when their interest rates were essentially zero or close to zero. They're not zero anymore, and they're probably going up some. Yeah, but the debt didn't go away. I mean, the debt that, that was created at zero is now at three. Uh, and probably by the end of the year, it's going to be four and a half. Is that going to constrain, do you think, Congress and its ability to borrow that money in the future? I mean, take a look at what happened in the UK. Yeah. I mean, when they said we're going to borrow a lot of money, it didn't work out so well. No. Are we going to have some of those constraints on fiscal spending here? I don't see how we can avoid it. In other words, I mean, you just... You know, it, it's, you know we're, we're dealing with a crisis in the fiat currency world. I mean, ever since Bretton Woods, the whole idea was create stability in the currency markets. And to a large extent, we've done that. Um, and then COVID came and we lost all of our discipline. And the net effect of which is that we've created, you know, staggering new obligations that are gonna have to be paid for in the future. Uh, part of it is being paid for with very significant inflation. For the first time since 1981, we're dealing with double-digit inflation. And it's extraordinarily deleterious. Well, there were many insolvent agents in the economy because uh, private and public debt as a share of GDP has gone from 200% to 350 globally between 2000 and today. In advanced economies, more like 420 and rising. In the US, is now higher than after the Great Depression and after World War II. And we're not out of a Great Depression or a major war. And until now, even if you had zombie households, corporates, banks, shadow banks, governments, countries, they were built out. They were built out during the global financial crisis, zero policy rates, negative, quantity easing, credit easing, and even during the COVID crisis, many of them were fragile. They were built out again. We went back to, get, to do even more of the same. This time around, instead, is different because we have so much debt and central banks like the Fed have to increase interest rates to fight inflation. So the zombie institutions are going to go bankrupt. That's why not only we're going to have inflation and stagflation, but we'll have a stagflationary debt crisis. In the 70s, we had negative supply shock, 73, 79, but we had very low debt ratios. So we didn't have a debt crisis in advanced economy. Economies. We had one in Latin America, Argentina, Mexico, Brazil borrowed too much in the 70s when Volcker jacked up pre interest rates to 20 percent, they went bankrupt. Today we have the worst of the 70s with a massive amount of stagflationary negative supply shock, so we get stagflationary debt crisis. Well, so what is the pain level that we're going to experience in order to get inflation under control? The Fed has said there's going to be pain. Yep. What's it going to look like? What's it going to look like in unemployment? What's it going to look like in business failings? What's it going to look like in defaults? Well, it, I think it, it starts with the fact that we've never really had uh, uh, a, a significant recession without a, without a liquidity crisis. And, you know, the Fed's been buying $80 billion worth of debt a month. And now the Fed's going to stop buying $80 billion a month. Uh, maybe not the first month, but in a couple of months, uh, that starts to change the game. And, and it's a liquidity crisis that ultimately uh, forces a, 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 a difference in behavior. Again, go back to the UK, we saw it with the pensions and sure. the derivatives they had for some long-term obligations. Uh, it often comes up where you least expect it. Uh, long-term capital management, for example. Yeah. 
Where would you be looking right now if you were the Fed to try to find the crack points in the financial system? Well, I'm, I'm continuing to be worried about uh, just overexpansion. You know, the fact that there's ultimately, you know, uh, unlimited demand for U.S. debt. Uh, I don't believe that. Uh, in the same manner, uh, you know, when I when I look at what's going on out there, um, I'm, I'm very worried about uh, the reserve currency and uh, and the privilege that gives the United States and the flexibility it gives the United States. And if we lose that stature, and we've seen stuff where, you know, Russia and China are trading in, in either rubles or yuan, or Saudi Arabia is talking about selling oil for yuan. Uh, if, if we lose control of the, of the reserve currency status, you're talking about a, a significant hit to our standard of living. I mean, to some extent, 10% inflation is the first step toward deteriorating our standard of living. But it's really the ability to, to issue debt, the ability to, you know, to, to be able to generate demand for our product because we are the reserve currency, it gives us an enormous advantage over the rest of the world. I talked to Ray Dalio recently and asked him about the strength of the dollar. He says, not the dollar is so good, it's just all the other fiat currencies exactly. are that That's much terrible. worse. That's right. So how, what kind of jeopardy does that put the dollar in if somebody actually figures out a way to do it a little better? Oh, I think that I think the dollar is in, is in great jeopardy. And, uh, and that's what I've been worried about, frankly, more than anything else. And uh, we need to, we need to, we need discipline. And, uh, and it starts in, in Washington, D.C., uh, where there has been very little. I think you want to go into gold and precious metal. Again, gold has not done very well because you had tight monetary policy, a strong dollar. But if central banks are going to blink and wimp out, gold is going to rise in value. Gold is going to rise in value also because the enemies of the U.S. are subject to sanctions. China now is worried. They have a trillion dollars of reserves in dollar. They have to move to other things. If it's euro and yen, they can be seized. The only thing that cannot be seized is gold. Of course, not in the vault in New York or London, but in Beijing or in Moscow and so on. Hello there, on behalf of SDBullion.com, this is James Anderson with a quick SD Bullion market update. Before we go further, please smash the like button so other sound money stackers can also see this content. And be sure to subscribe to our SD Bullion channel so you can get our latest market coverages and also a chance at winning incredible bullion giveaways like this one. Get ready for SD Bullion's Monster Box Sweepstakes that includes 500 Silver Eagles. You could be the next lucky recipient of a phone call like this. This is Dr. Tyler Wall, CEO of SD Bullion. Well, I'm calling you to let you know that you won the SD Bullion giveaway of a monster box of Silver Eagles. So click the link below for your chance to win. Click the link below to enter our new 500 ounce American Silver Eagle coin type two giveaway contest. And good luck to all of you who take part. The Fiat Fed note spot prices for silver and gold traded sideways, finishing slightly down for the week. The silver spot price closes at around 1930 an ounce ask. Gold spot price closes around 16.50 an ounce ask, and the gold silver ratio stayed flat at 85. A few days ago, popular alternative financial news website Zero Hedge picked up on the story about record high bid and ask prices for one ounce American silver eagle coins in the bullion industry. SD Bullion founder and CEO Tyler Wall had the following comments regarding this ongoing situation. Silver stackers we talk to on a regular basis seem to be getting tired of hearing about the market tightness without any movement in the bank spot price. However, obviously, that could be about to change if the COMEX and LBMA vault drain continues for much longer. One of the individuals I speak to regularly who has first-hand knowledge of a COMEX depository's operation told me recently that they didn't think there's any unspoken silver left, just people haven't figured it out yet. An interesting comment, given that there is supposedly 35 million ounces of registered silver left at the COMEX. Some silver bullion production is ordered out through March 2023, and nearly every silver round slash coin is at at least four week delays from purchased, most six to eight weeks. There already exists on the wholesale market what will be manifesting in retail trading across the space in the coming weeks, a complete uncoupling of price for live deliverable silver. You can already see that in the U.S. Mint Silver Eagles, where premiums are now nearly 100% spot price. In the rare occurrence someone is quoting inventory that's actually there on a shelf and ready to ship that day, premium becomes almost irrelevant in this market. There's virtually no price quoted that is too high, 
with the benefit of three hours hindsight. You snooze, you lose. Dr. Tyler Wall, SD Bullying Inc. And so Zero Hedge retorts, the big question is always, where do we go from here? Well, we're gonna follow up on where we go from here um, by looking at some of the tea leaves in the gold and silver markets, especially regarding the major comics and LBMA vault drain that continues. My Twitter friend, at MikeSay98, continues diligently updating the ongoing silver drain from the collective comics silver warehouses. Registered comics silver has now fallen to 35.5 million ounces this week, while the eligible pile sits at a seemingly large figure of 265 million ounces, but shrinking. Notice I said seemingly in regards to the eligible, not warranted, or yet made deliverable larger pile that makes up the supposed 301 million ounces that fractionally backs the leveraged comics derivative casino. You see, fellow industry colleague Ronan Manley of Singapore's Bullion Star recently pointed out this interesting tidbit of information published on both the Comics' CME Group website and the supposed regulator agency's website, the CFTC. Apparently, in February 2021, aside from tamping down interest in silver by jacking up margin requirements, the CME Group was also busy studying at the time how much of the then-eligible silver pile around 240 million ounces at the time, could or would be deliverable if push came to shove and the owners of those ounces felt it worth their while in doing so. Well, I suppose at CME Group, after speaking with various industry players, they guessed or concluded about 50% of the then eligible pile might be deliverable in some form or fashion. Just a few months later, around that time, Metals Focus reported about 103 million ounces of the J.P. Morgan Comics New York warehouse was unsecured SLV silver bullion spoken for by that continually underperforming silver ETF and trust. So if we simply extrapolate those figures to today, the combined registered and eligible piles of perhaps deliverable silver if the owners were moved to sell and deliver it, it's about 170 million ounces total at the moment. Yeah, it sounds like a massive amount, but in relative terms, it's not. The U.S. Mint, for instance, has to date sold over 617 million ounces of one-ounce American Silver Eagle bullion coins, the same ones that are being bid at record high prices. You can be confident that high 90 percentile of which, those are still in the United States, and they're owned by long-term bullion savers. And at about $30 an ounce at the moment, that's uh, $18.5 billion notional in collective value. The 170 million ounces... The estimate I just made about comics that's uh, deliverable, if we simply assume that they've sold today at 20 an ounce, that's only 3.4 billion of silver bullion fractionally backing the comics. Since early 2021, we have already seen around 100 million ounces of silver up and disappear from the combined registered and eligible comic silver pile. And if the registered amount keeps shrinking at the rate it's been falling at, look out Q1 next year 2023 for the zero bound. Moving on to the City of London, another major portion of this three-card Monty the financial establishment still calls the silver price discovery markets, we see the red line, which is the, cur the current record rate of Indian silver demand, which kicked off in September 2021 after the wedding season COVID lockdowns rolling for a year and a half. And we juxtapose it next to the vanishing London silver warehouse pile, again, most of which is spoken for, unsecured ETF silver third party owned already. Even the Silver Institute is now writing tweets that look akin to a supposed silver pumper. The issue is that we all are highlighting verifiable facts here. When this chart gets updated with the September 2022 near 55 million ounce silver bullion import flow into India now behind us, the nation of India will be on the cusp of likely breaking their all time Indian silver bullion import record demand from 2015 already. And the year's Indian silver bullion import flow is not done. Have a listen, the best you can through his accent, to what Shirag Sheth of London-based precious metals consultancy Metals Focus said this past weekend on an Indian CNBC-like financial news channel. So while in India we are looking at a record number and 8,000 tons you say is already done, which is the highest ever, what is it that you're forecasting this year to end with? 
Uh, well, uh, to be honest, we were uh, playing around with a number of seven to seven and a half thousand tons of fuel year. So this has already surpassed our expectation. Uh, we believe another, uh, you know, uh, 800 to 900 tons each month uh, could very well come into the market. So we could be very well uh, moving past 10,000 tons for the calendar. So he just sheepishly admitted that India is likely headed to import over 10,000 metric tons of silver bullion alone in 2022. Now that's over 321 million ounces, or about one third of the world's annual silver supply. Any questions remaining about why the city of London's silver bullion is being drained? Oh, and again, about one third of the COMEX uh, current warehouse pile is spoken for SLV silver sitting in New York. And finally, as I've stated publicly before, the ongoing silver bullion squeeze phenomenon likely leads to a gold bullion squeeze as well. I remind you the COMEX 400 ounce 4GC gold futures contract, which was invented in March 2020, likely so London and COMEX could double count 400 ounce gold bars in major unsecured ETFs like GLD and IEU. Well, that 400 ounce 4GC COMEX gold futures contract still has no trading volume. Western ETF gold sales over the last year and a half have heavily contributed to over 14 million ounces of gold, leaving the West, the COMEX, likely headed East to India, China, Turkey, and other Eastern Central Banks and investor stashes. The trends and evidence point to my still firm opinion of where this all leads. Basically, there's gonna come an era where any large deliverable amounts of either silver bullion and or gold bullion price reasonably close to quoted spot and our futures market quotations it will not be findable. And those that are too late will get to own underperforming unsecured ETF slush funds like SLV, GLD, or IEU. I sincerely hope you'll not be one of them, having already secured your prudent bullion stash before that potential wide-scale physical bullion shortage era finally arrives. That's all for this week's SD Bullion Market Update. As always, to you out there, take great care of yourselves and those you love. If you enjoyed this content, be sure to give our video a thumbs up. To keep getting bullion-related news and industry insights, be sure to subscribe to our channel. Finally, hit that alert button so you know when we publish fresh content.